Welcome, everybody, and I am Bill Gall. I'm the Air and Water Coordinator here at Acadia National Park, and I am joined by Rachel Fowler from the University of Maine. Um, this is kind of like an encore edition of this presentation. We, we did this first uh, for the Green Lake Association uh, back in August at their annual meeting uh, at a request uh, that I got to, to talk a little bit about climate change and in main lakes and how they can be affected. And I thought, what better person to have uh, <clears throat> uh, give some better perspective than, than Rachel. Um, she's been associated with the uh, doing research in the park and cooperating on a lot of water quality projects since 2015 or so. And um, we're glad to have her here. So with, without further ado, we'll get rolling. Um, so first of all, as I as I mentioned, you know, we probably don't have to do well too long on some of the climate change effects for this audience. I think everybody's pretty aware, but when you actually look at the um we're we're fortunate that we have a really good uh source of documentation of the rate of climate change in the um publication uh series that is done by the Climate Change Institute, the main climate future. Um, analysis that, that are updated every three or four years, I think, or so. Um, so we just compiled a couple of updates um, from the, the 2020, 2020 version um, to talk about the magnitude of how Maine's climate is changing. And basically, the take home point is that at average annual temperature increased about 3.2 degrees Fahrenheit in the last 124 years. And the six warmest years occurred since 1998. So you know, that's pretty significant there. Um, in terms of precipitation, um, there's been about a 15% increase um, of 5.8 inches. And it's basically more rain and less snow is what we're all pretty uh, commonly seeing. Um, the annual snowfall depth decreased um, about 20%, uh, 2.3 inches since 8, 1895, but it's been a really long, slow decline. You can see that. We, um, so that's pretty much what we're, what we're dealing with. And ice is the same way. You know, that seems to be really, really variable. Um, we've got some ice observations from some of the MDI lakes that date back to at least the early 90s, and in some cases, the late 1980s, um, that most of them were, a lot of them early on, were done by some of the ranger staff. Um, and this is some of the observations for Jordan Pond. There's a couple of incomplete years where either we didn't have a ice on date or so we don't have a complete bar. And then in 2020, we weren't able to get any measurements because of the pandemic. So we don't have a complete record in there, but you can kind of see how all over the map it is and how, um, you know, there are some years, can't see it on here where we had completely 2011 and or 2012, 2013, the, the lake never flows over completely. Mm -hmm. And um, this is kind of up to date. Um, on, in 21 and 22, um, the ice was on, on uh, January 17th and off on March 23rd, which was three days shorter than the last bar that was up there. And then this year, we had a really, really short season. It was only fully frozen for about a month. It was from uh, February 3rd to um, March 5th was the, the total span of the ice time. So, you know, that affects lakes in, in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, ice cover and how thick it is uh, affects how much 
um, how quickly the lake warms because of how much sunlight is exposed to, how much wind action helps to circulate the water. Um, what are the other effects? I mean, it's it's countless. Yeah, it's, so. <laughs> you know, we've got a couple of slides in here where we kind of look at those interactions between everything, and it's pretty complex. But uh, you know, this the whole um, uh, everything is unpredictable, and everything is different. So it's really interesting to be able to try to correlate, which we haven't really done formally yet. But it's on our wish list to, to correlate the ice cover with a lot of the water quality conditions and water chemistry and lake process um, that happened throughout that year. Um, so generally, um, in terms of how climate change affects lakes, how warming temperatures affects lakes, how changing um, levels, you know, it's the obvious, um, obvious change of uh, water levels, drought, and, and flood effects. Um, and we have so many stakeholders in park lakes, you know, other than just park visitors and other than just the natural processes. We have, you know, um, six or seven of the lakes on the island that are part of public water supply systems. Um, we have numerous lakes that are um, partially bounded by the park and have have private residences on other um, portions of them. So there's lakefront property owners that have their own, uh, you know, preferences as far as water levels and things like that. And we have enough problems with natural processes where the, the lakes go up and down. And then we have beavers that also have their preferences. And it's a pretty complex uh, equation when you put all these things together. Um, so the other thing that's really interesting is we, we have an ongoing problem with, with uh, mercury contamination in state of Maine. Um, some of the fish with the highest body burdens of mercury um, in a study back in the 19, late 1980s were captured from uh, park lakes. And um, we, the, the mercury methylation, which allows the mercury to bioaccumulate in, in organisms, is actually um, enhanced with changing water levels. So there's really um, a lot of um, benefit in having stable water levels because. Um, there's, it reduces the effect of the mercury methylation. So that's another reason why we kind of always try to aim for stability if, if possible. Um, and then of course the public access, you know, issues for, for uh, boat launches and things like that. Thankfully we're not as bad as Lake Mead, but who knows what will happen in the future. So. Uh, temperature increases, the obvious effect of warmer temperatures is it holds less oxygen than, than cool water. So um, for organisms that depend on that, you know, it's it's a much, um, they, they gravitate towards cooler weather, uh, water where they can. Um, it can affect aquatic species distribution and um, can be attractive to invasive species and allow them to thrive. And then, of course, the problem that seems to be kind of forefront on the horizon right now, not to your project title, is harmful algal blooms um, and increased plant growth of both, both phytoplankton and cyanobacteria that cause the harmful algal blooms and just general uh, vegetation between both layers. Um, when we have more precipitation as we're having, we get a lot more runoff as well too. And that, you know, so the soil can add nutrients um, into the water, which then act as fertilizer to promote the, um, the growth of plants. Um, it also provides more um, organic carbon a lot of times, which can contribute to the browning of the water, which makes it a, a darker color which in turn 
absorbs more light, which increases the heat of the water. So it's all, all these interactive kind of cycling processes that happen. Um, and also the things that glom onto those particles are bacteria sometimes. So, um, you know, earlier this summer, we had a couple of big rainfalls where we had a lot of high bacteria levels in Echo Lake, which was pretty rare, um, but it happens and it usually always happens after those rainfalls. So, um, and I think that's about it for there. So we've been fortunate enough that we have a really long data history uh, for a lot of the water quality and physical conditions in the lakes and our parks. Um, and we have had kind of several eras of, of really good data um, that were collected. The, the first being in the 1940s, there was a study by Fuller and Cooper that was commissioned by um, the uh, Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife that sent these two professors from University of Maine around to all the lakes in the state and they, they did volumes um, of complete surveys of water quality, fish, plants, everything of all the main lakes. And that's kind of been the baseline. Um, a number of university, a couple of University of Maine uh, professors had kind of um, uh, done recent analyses using their their methodology and found that you know it was probably pretty good uh, chemistry methodology. So that's kind of what a lot of us consider the first really good data to be able to compare things to. So they did a, a entire volume on the lakes of NBI and Hancock County, I guess it was in general. Um, so we had the first kind of really credible data points from that study. And then from there on, um, there have been a bunch of kind of isolated uh, uh, research studies and things like that through the 1970s or so that kind of constitute a few other little points of uh, data in our late water quality history. And then starting in 1980, we had a lot of research again by um, Steve Norton, Steve Call, Richard Keith, and a bunch of University of Maine faculty, and who were at that point, some of them were grad students at the time, that did a lot of um, research on the effects of acid rain, of acid deposition. And those studies were often replicated every five years or so, so that we have a continuous record, again, with great methodology, with the same lab techniques and lab itself that's actually doing the analysis today. So it's a lot of consistency, a lot of great data, and um, those um, those findings have been used extensively to really track the effects and the effectiveness of the Clean Air Act um, on the park. So that's that's really great. And then in the early 90s, um, we really began to start to have a structured park monitoring program because prior to about 1994 or 95, um, we cooperated with the main DEP in their volunteer monitoring program. And we used to kind of accompany DEP biologists when they did their um, <clears throat> summer baseline monitoring in the park. And we would do kind of very rudimentary um, monthly monitoring, um, but then we had a, um, in the early 1990s, we began the water resource management plan um, to come up with a kind of an overarching way to mark water resources. And at that time, we decided we were gonna have a um, workshop to kind of really develop a, a good monitoring program. So maybe in 1996, and then, 2006, um, the uh, Park Service Inventory and Monitoring Program really started to come take its stride. And uh, we were a member of the Northeast Temperate Network, which consists of 11 Northeast parks. Um, and we uh, set up a monitoring protocol for both lakes and streams 
that were based on the, the Acadia and Lake monitoring protocols, and then expanded that into streams, and that's what we're using throughout the all the network parks. Um, so that's been kind of our um, go-to protocol to date. Um, it's a lot of really great information. There's been a lot of reporting, and it's a story in itself with the whole history. Um, so currently what we do in our lakes is um, for the NETN monitoring, um, we, we monitor monthly. Uh, Jake and Kathleen are the, are the boots on the ground for the current uh, iteration of that. Um, we visit usually about uh, 11 or 12 lakes each month. Um, and we do profiles with a water quality sun to collect temperature, dissolved oxygen, specific conductance, and pH um, throughout the water column so we can kind of see what's going on. We take transparency measurements with a secchi disc, lowering that down to see how deep in the water column it's visible. And we take water samples for phosphorus, nitrogen, uh, dissolved organic carbon, and chlorophyll A that are um, analyzed up at the University of Maine lab from the Climate Change Institute, the Sawyer lab. Um, and that's basically our, um, our monthly monitoring. And we, we track a whole you know, round of um, lakes. There are eight of them that we are sampled annually. And then the other um, three each year rotate um, some of the smaller lakes so that we can get as much, as many in as possible. Um, the other thing that we have to couple with that is we have our air quality monitoring program, which includes the meteorology. So, you know, when I talked about the um, relationship between air quality and water quality, acid rain, we're measuring the sources as well too. And the, the data history is, is actually similar. So we started monitoring our acid deposition back in 1981. And we started the kind of systematic uh, meteorology monitoring in the early 90s, I think it was like 1992. Um, so we can kind of couple that with the water data and, and actually Rachel's got some great um, slides later on that show some of the relationships between the acid deposition and the um, water quality data. Um, but they really demonstrate the effectiveness of the Clean Air Act. And we're, we're unique here in that we're measuring the stressors, those air pollutants, and the effects all in the same place, rather than having to interpolate you know, data from some sort of regional source. So we've got it all, which is great. Um, in 2013, we were lucky enough to get the um, um, high resolution monitoring buoy that we've got monitored in Jordan Pond, thanks to fundraising from Friends of Acadia. And what that does is takes continuous measurements every 15 minutes of a handful of, of a bunch of parameters. Um, basically, we have a larger sonde in here that does everything that we do with our um, the one that we bring on our monthly trip, but it also has a, a total algae probe. It's got it measures chlorophyll and phycocyanin. Um, it's got a um, carbon dissolved uh, organic matter probe at dawn. And um, we've got a temperature string that measures down to 16 meters um, every 15 minutes. So we can we can measure that um, the changes in the water temperature throughout the water column. Also, some light sensors that measure the light penetration on a regular basis. So that that really nicely fills in all the blanks um, because you know the traditional lake monitoring is done once a month, probably for about an hour there. So it's just a little snapshot. So if you look at the the upper graphs, that's basically just an example of the temperature um, of uh, upper surface layer of the water during, uh, what year is that supposed to be? I don't know, whatever. oh, over the years, in, in August. Um, and then the second graph on the right is the 
the depth of that upper warm surface level. So you just got one little point here and you have to kind of try to connect the dots to make it see what it looks like. But if you look at the lower graphs, those thermal plots, those basically graph the temperature by the color indications and also how deep in the water color that the water column that temperature layer goes. So you really have a continuous um, continuous value and the, the areas that are kind of boxed off there are just what those dots represent, that, that amount of change. So this has been proven to be an invaluable tool in really understanding how everything changes and you can you can you can pick out a heck of a lot more. Um, the other thing with the that the high frequency data allows us to do is really see the changes that happen over the uh, course of time in relation to the weather. And um, we have a weather station at the Jordan Pond House as well, too. Um, so we get local conditions there. And this just shows how uh, rain affects the uh, concentrations of FDOM, the dissolved organic matter that's in the water. And you can see that following those rainstorms, and this is this is kind of specific around the um, the July nineteenth storm this year. Um, how in the in the latter section you see that that huge rain on the on the top graph and getting a spike in in Efton that comes up. Um, so that's really. So I get a lot of I get a lot of questions, especially lately, on you know how fast are the lakes in Acadia warming, and are they? And the simple answer is yes, but it depends on which lake and where you look, and there's a lot of you know kind of factors involved in how to answer that question. So this is. Looking at Jordan Pond over the past, uh, you know, almost 30 years, and doesn't seem to be too much of a trend. You can see a little bit of warming in the in the last five years, certainly. But you know, if you put that polynomial trend line in there, which is just a little cell thing, but it doesn't show much significance at all. Um, but if you look at the surface layer say the first 10 meters or so, it's the warmest, then you start to see probably a little bit more of a trend because you know it's a smaller amount of water, it's closer to the surface, it's more highly affected from uh, by the air temperature. Um, and then if you look at a smaller lake, like Witch Hole Pond, it's a lot shallower, a lot less volume, you see even a stronger trend and then carry that over to uh, the surface layer and it, things become more pronounced. But then when you kind of look at things uh, monthly, now we're just looking at May, we we'll go back to Jordan and uh, throughout the whole water column, we see a stronger trend in May than you do in June, July, in August, but inherently what that means is the lake is warming faster and it's staying warmer for more of the season. So, you know, these all kind of make a difference. Um, again, as you can see in these graphs, that's a little more pronounced um, in the uh, surface layers monthly, and the same thing carries on in the shallower lakes. So, Obviously, there's a lot going on, and this is all the kind of stuff that goes on, and that's where I pass the ball to my student. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Okay, so Bill talked a lot about the effects of precipitation and dissolved organic matter in the lake, and he showed that high frequency um, weather station and buoy sensor data figure. And that is a smaller piece of what we see in this concept map that's showing linkages among the lake and the landscape and the airshed. And within the lake, 
we have a lot of different factors at play. The climate exerts pressure on the lake, which then kind of ripple out through physical, chemical, and biological factors and processes in the lake. Um, so instead of getting lost in the weeds of all the arrows and linkages on this figure, I thought we could focus on the example of precipitation and the effects of precipitation because anyone who's been in Maine this summer knows how much precipitation we have had. Um, we've had so many events that are defined as extreme precipitation events that are greater than an inch or two of rain accumulated within 24 hours. So if we look at, um, yeah. oh, oh, that's okay. Um, if we look at that inner, that you to go? Uh, nope. I was just going to use the laser. Oh, uh, old school here. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we look at this inner circle and we're thinking about climate or the summer weather pressures on the lake, let's let's go with precipitation as our example. So precipitation directly affects physical factors in the lake, whether they're mixing, um, thinking about stratification and the strength of stratification, or light. How clear is the water? How deep is the secchi depth? Um, and then chemical factors like nutrients. What effect does it have on nutrients in the lakes? And then all of these factors ripple out with linkages to other chemical and biological factors in the lake. So those affect how much dissolved oxygen you have. They affect algal dynamics. So what types of algae you have in the lakes, how much do you have um, at what times you have which types of communities in the season, and then of course fish. And I, I know I don't have to talk to this group about the impact of these changes in lakes because you know all about that. Um, impacts on recreation, of course, um, economic effects, and then our health and well-being. As Bill mentioned, there are several lakes in the park that are used as drinking water sources. So that's looking at the effects of these external pressures on a lake. But then we can also think about the landscape too. And Bill touched on this already. So if we're thinking about extreme precipitation events, there are long-term and short-term processes at play between the landscape and the lake. So if we're thinking in the short term, probably most of us at first think of runoff and erosion, and we're concerned about what that means for lakes. And of course, that can affect dissolved or organic carbon and nutrients and light levels and so many of these factors. And then on a longer time scale, if we think about vegetation over the course of a season or several seasons, we can ask questions about um, what types of vegetation do we have on the landscape? Is that changing? Is the duration of when things are growing changing? Is their extent changing? That's really important for the type and the amount of dissolved organic carbon that can be transported to lakes. And then thinking about the airshed, which is what Bill was just talking about. So these data are from the McFarland Hill Station, not far away. And we start back in 1983 and go to 2021. And what I wanna point out here is how, like Bill said, we can actually measure um, reductions in acid rain in the form of wet deposition of nitrate and sulfate and we can think about how the lakes are responding to that. So the reason that these steady declines in wet nitrate and sulfate are so interesting and important um, is that acid deposition affects how the soil holds on to dissolved organic matter. Um, and we can see that after the Clean Air Act amendments were enacted, in 1990, that's when that green circle is, we have these steady declines. And that affects 
um, that transport of dissolved organic matter from the landscape to the lakes, which if we think back to that concept map, affects light levels and secchi depth, nutrients, temperature. So in addition to this high resolution data and monitoring data, another approach to our understanding of lakes in Acadia and lakes in Maine is a paleolimnological approach, which is a whole other long-term, long, long-term approach. So this is my colleague, Ben, back in 2016. We had just taken a sediment core from Seal Cove Pond, and we're getting it set up to extrude, which means to splice it into really thin slices. And we dated those slices of sediment, and then we extracted algal pigments from the sediment and um, identified and counted diatoms in the sediment to get a record over time of environmental change and um, how the ecology in the lake changed over time. So in these crucibles here, we have dried sediment. That's what we use to date the core. And then in these vials, those colored um, liquids are pigments that were extracted from the sediment. So those are algal pigments that have been preserved over time. And then the other two pictures are pictures I took with my cell phone through the microscope of diatoms from Silicon Pond. So this is a piece of what the results of this paleo project look like. Um, and I took this out of a paper we published last year in the Journal of Paleolimnology. So these are results for Seal Cove Pond, and I'm not going to show them to you, but we also have a similar figure for Jordan Pond, and we were comparing the two lakes. <clears throat> so to orient you to this figure, on the x-axis, we have all of these columns, and these represent different algal pigments that are associated with certain groups of algae, so diatoms or chlorophytes or colonial cyanobacteria. And then the link of the bars is indicated by um, the, the pigment concentration on the x-axis. So if you have a longer bar, that means that pigment concentration is higher. And then on the y-axis, we have time, starting at 2016 when we took the core all the way back to 1880. So um, what we learned from this core, what we think we learned, is that in Silco Pond, after 1990, when the Clean Air Act amendments went into place, we start seeing some evidence of recovery in Seal Cove Pond back to pre-acidification conditions um, that we had earlier in the 1900s. And we think this is happening um, because as you can see in several of the groups, in several of the algal groups, we start getting pigment concentrations that are rebounding back to what they used to be in the past um, after 1990, which is what this green um, line represents. However, this is really tricky to tease apart because there are multiple external drivers going on. There's not just recovery from acid deposition. We're also in a period of rapid climate change, as Bill talked about. Um, but what we think we're seeing in Seal Cove Pond in this recovery to pre acidification conditions. And we think that as that soil affinity for dissolved organic carbon changes because acid deposition is reduced, um, we think that that's affecting the transport of dissolved organic matter, dissolved organic carbon to the lake. And we think that that dissolved organic matter is a nutrient subsidy for these different algal groups. And now I'm really excited to talk to you about this project. This is the first time that I've formally shared any results. Um, so I'm glad to have the opportunity to be here and do this today. So this is a project that we've been working on since 2020. Harmful algal blooms or halves on the horizon, question mark. So this is a project that 
came to be because of the very rich history of long-term data that we have in the park, thanks to Bill and his team and many other people who have been collecting data. So we have, as you can see, all these different water quality metrics since the 90s, and in some cases, even um, before the 90s. And we also have that high frequency monitoring data from certain funds. Um, so we have a lot of information to think about what's been happening in the lakes in the past. And then we did some contemporary sampling to think about what's going on right now. And I'm trying to build a risk assessment for different lakes in the park that are representative of many lakes in the park to think about how vulnerable might different lakes be to harmful algal blooms in the future. So I'm going to share temperature, dissolved oxygen, and phycocyanin data with you today. Those were the primary metrics that we proposed to look at, although we looked at a whole host of different water quality <clears throat> metrics. And we also looked at the symmetry of different lakes. So on this project, we primarily focused on three lakes. Um, and we're using these as um, kind of representatives of different lake types in the park, mostly based on trophic status, um, but also other qualities too. <clears throat> so we've got Jordan Pond, which of course is very clear and very deep, low nutrients, deep, sucky. Um, it's an oligotrophic lake that is entirely within the boundaries of the park, fully protected. And then we have Silpo Pond, which is more oligo to mesotrophic, um, not so deep, not so clear, higher nutrients. And then um, one side of Silpo, Silpo Pond, of course, has residential development on it. And the third lake we're looking at is Rich Hole Pond, which is even smaller, um, more mesotrophic, sometimes eutrophic, um, shallower, secchi, higher nutrients. So these are the three study lakes. So I've got two different types of temperature plots, two ways of thinking about temperature. So in the bottom row, we've got those thermal plots, like the ones Bill showed us earlier. Um, so if you can't see, the first column is Jordan Pond, the middle is Seal Co Pond, and the, end, the right side is Witch Hole Pond. And then in the top row, we have got a top temperature and a bottom temperature for each lake. So in 2020, throughout the entire season, from ice out into the fall, we had um, sensors in the lake at the surface and then near the bottom. So that was 30 meters for Jordan Pond, um, 10 meters deep for Silco Pond, and seven meters for Ritual Pond. So we've got the top and the bottom temperature and dissolved oxygen sensors. So this is some really interesting and different dynamics among the lakes here with temperature. So before I talk about those, I want to preface it by saying there's a lot of literature saying that 25 degrees Celsius is kind of a sweet spot for cyanobacterial growth. Um, there's a lot of cyanobacterial groups who have their optimal growth rates at 25 degrees or above, as opposed to other types of algae, which do better at <coughs> cooler temperatures. So if we look at that top temperature sensor um, in Jordan Ponds, the max temp was 24.9 degrees, which happened at the end of July, beginning of August in 2020, as opposed to Seal Cove Pond and Witch Hole Pond, which both got up to 28 and 29 degrees um, as their max surface temperature. And then if we think about this top layer of warm water in the lakes, the average temperature of that epilimnion, that top, that surface layer, um, never reached 25 for very long in Jordan Ponds, but in Seal Cove Pond and Witch Hole Pond, those lakes average 25 degrees Celsius or greater in the epilimnion, epilimnion for weeks at a time throughout the summer of 2020. And then we can see really different 
dynamics in the bottom water temperature too. And as Phil mentioned, um, these lakes in the past decade or so have been, especially uh, in some months more than others, have been increasing in temperature, but particularly um, a small lake like Switch Hole Pond. So if we're thinking about our risk assessment for halves, um, we definitely want to keep our eyes on which whole pond and lakes similar. So these are dissolved oxygen plots. And in the literature, dissolved oxygen is often described as a precursor to algal blooms. And we can kind of get a positive feedback cycle if we're thinking about dissolved oxygen and algal blooms. Um, so depending on the sediment chemistry of a lake, if the bottom waters become anoxic for any amount of time, the sediment can release phosphorus, which is often a limiting nutrient for algal growth in, in lakes, in some lakes, not all lakes. And when I say depending on the chemistry of the sediment, I'm talking about ratios of aluminum to iron and aluminum to phosphorus. So for example, in Jordan Pond, um, the sediment chemistry ratios are there. So that if condition, conditions became anoxic, we might expect sediment and phosphorus release. But you can see in Jordan Pond, um, those bottom waters, the dark blue line, are not anywhere close to becoming anoxic. So we're not worried about that for Jordan Pond. And for seal hole ponds, the sediment chemistry conditions are not such that we, we think phosphorus, phosphorus would be released um, under anoxic conditions. So even though at the end of July and into August, there is anoxia or a lack of oxygen in the bottom waters of seal hole pond, we don't think there's evidence that phosphorus is being released. Um, and phosphorus could fuel an algal bloom, and an algal bloom could use up oxygen, leading to more algal blooms. That's the positive feedback cycle that I mentioned before. And then we get to Pichol Pond again, and we don't have sediment chemistry data yet for Pichol Pond. But our nutrient data, our phosphorus data, suggests that phosphorus is being released from the sediments during this period in the summer where the bottom waters are anoxic. So with that, I want to pop over to phycocyanin. So phycocyanin is a pigment that's an indicator of cyanobacteria. It doesn't tell us anything about whether the cyanobacteria are toxic or not. It just tells us if they're there and at what relative concentration. So we got some really interesting data in 2020. Um, so these plots are made, they're interpolated from bi-weekly water column sampling. So in Jordan Pond and Silco Pond, you can see that there's not too much happening in the water column in terms of high cyclocyanin concentration, except for this wacky date in August in Jordan Pond where there was cyclocyanin measured throughout the water column. But at the surface of both those lakes, um, we think that there were some ephemeral cyanobacterial scums at least on a few dates throughout the summer. And then which whole pond is telling a different story. So we don't have those really high levels at the top, but we do throughout July and August and into September, we do throughout almost all layers of the water column have some phycocyanin present. And if we were to bounce back to those dissolved oxygen and temperature plots, they would overlay really nicely with these higher concentrations of phycocyanin, which indicate um, cyanobacteria. But again, we don't have any data about toxicity or lack of toxicity. So I think 
I will leave the results there. And if you're interested, I'm hoping to show more new data at the science symposium this fall. Thank you for being here today. And John and I are happy. I don't know if we have any time, but we're happy yeah, to absolutely. answer questions for a few minutes if you have any. So am I gathering though that which whole pond out of it would be the one and like similar to that would be ones that we'd be worried about or have? I think so. In the future? I think so. And um, you know, and for example, anoxia isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's a natural process that yeah. happens in a lot of main lakes in the summertime during peak stratification. But a lot of factors come into play, like the, the basin morphometry of the lake and the sediment chemistry and just what types of algae are already there. So I think which hole is the one that we have our eyes on, certainly. What about Lakewood? Did you expect Lakewood to be because that's people swim in Lakewood? Right. <laughs> right. Um very possibly. Very possibly. And that's one of the things that we we may be finding out. Uh, uh sorry guys, uh Bill's computer went down and so but I think we should be back online in, in terms of sound. Um, so, so. Here, I'll take the owl and we can just run it off my oh yeah. How do you take sort of rad framework and when you how do you apply that to this? Like what do you do? Do you resist, do you accept, do you direct? What's sort of the management response to does it come in rap? Well, the one thing we have to do is to educate and awareness. I mean, I think that's the main thing to to make people realize because it's unpredictable really exactly when this is going to happen. But we do know that they're happening more in this area than they have in the past, you know, history of, uh, so uh, my, my kind of inclination is that we're kind of right on the doors right now. Um, so we have, a um, we've been participating in a project with um, other national parks for the past two years, um, looking at, um, we've been doing some monitoring for um, presence of harmful algal blooms um, of the cyanobacteria and also for presence of toxins in the water. Um, so we can kind of get a feel for where those might be occurring. We haven't found anything yet in our lakes um, and this year we're, we're just about to uh, take some samples where we're going to use some, um, they're, they're analyzing for eDNA for some of these species. Um, so that's going to be another um, area. But I think, you know, um, to see if there's, there's any indication, even though we haven't seen any actual blooms, but that may be a better tool to see if there are low levels of some of these target species. Um, and then I think we have to make visitors aware that this is an ongoing problem um, and that they should be, uh, we're, we're hoping possibly next year we can get a little more actively uh, involved in this Bloom Watch program that actually um, encourages visitors to use uh, citizen science and uh, cell phone photos that they can submit you know, so that we can have eyes and ears out there because we can't see everything all the time. Um, uh, interestingly enough, um, Surimont Springs, you know, the spring pool down there, that, that tends to get a little bit green sometimes in the summer, even though we've had the, the leach field um, um, 
you know, replaced and, and some of the, the real smoking gun nutrient sources removed, um, there's still an issue there. And we were thinking that might be a good target space for awareness to make people aware of that project and and um you know keep an eye on some of the other lakes so those are some of the things we have in store and um you know then then the issue is what to do if there is a bloom because then we need some sort of a advisory program just as we do for bacteria or air quality or something like that because you know the the issues are that uh, it can be harmful to humans but it's especially harmful to pets, you know, that's where you actually get um, the stories about about uh, pets that drink water from a, a lake where there's a, a harmful algal bloom and can be sick and or, or die. So, you know, we'll have to kind of figure out ways to do this. And it's a lot of our parks in warmer areas, you know, they all already have things. So I think we would kind of take cues from areas where this is more common. Does it affect fish and, and harps and other things? I, mean, I know it can make mammals sick, but do you see fish die-offs? Um, does IF and W know about this? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, mostly what I hear in terms of fish die-offs and when the water gets too warm and the oxygen gets too low. So the anoxia, I, not the... Yeah, okay. but in terms of the effects of <laughs> cyanotoxins, um, mostly you hear about problems with people and their pets in terms of dermatitis or even liver or kidney or gastro issues. But I haven't read very much about fish or herps or anything of that nature. No. No, it's either that's either viruses or you know things like that that are different. I have a question about the foods. Why is the temperature strong? 15 meters as opposed to the full depth. Is that just a target that at the linear or? Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> ideally, it probably would have been better to go for 20, mm -hmm. I think, because we, um, you know, once you get below, as you kind of see from some of our profiles that are a little bit longer, you know, once you get below 20 to 25, you've gone through that that uh, transition period, that thermal climb, and it's all pretty much the same. So anything below, let's say, 25 feet is pretty much, you know, consistent. Um, part of it was just based on how much we could afford. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we were very, very fortunate that we got $75,000 to buy that buoy, um, you know, which was which was great. But even that had its limitations. That's all the buying power we had. So. We did the best we could. <laughs> and you removed the buoy when it, when there's ice coverage, is that right? Yeah. So there, I mean, do you do it based on when there is ice, or do you take it out and put it in like at the same time? We we always pull it out um, in like the first week of November, or so because you know it would it probably wouldn't survive very well. I I think battery wise and everything else you know throughout the winter so um there were a couple of seasons where we did have temperature strings under the ice for rachel's project and a couple of the other ones that were kind of associated with mm -hmm. some of her colleagues um so we do have some data but it would be it would be interesting to kind of do that more consistently that's one of our that's one of our real data gaps is is um subsurface, you know, sub ice mm -hmm. information from any of the lakes in the park, both in temperature and in water quality. There are some places that, you know, actually bore holes and do water quality measurements in the winter time, but we've never, never gone there yet. Um, so. So are there, are there a lot of papers like describing uh, the recovery of lakes like these from the, after the Clean Air Act? Um, is this a common story that's been told? Like you were mentioning that we have the physical measurements to actually say how the Clean Air Act impacted what's falling from the sky. Um, but how do we do we also have there been a lot of stories actually talking about the recovery of 
the forests or, or or lakes communities like like what you were talking about in your paper it, from yeah it depends year. where you're looking at there's a cluster um like new york ohio pennsylvania area which is another area that in the past has that you know had severe industrial pollution and air pollution and they've they've seen recovery and there's a lot of papers about um changing DOC in the lakes as a result of that. But um, I think our cluster here in Maine is one of the primary cases too. Yeah, I mean, it's in terms of the, the actual pH recovery and acid deposition effects, I mean, uh, you know, Sarah Nelson has done a series of papers with Steve Call and some others you know, kind of looking at that point of, of acidification recovery and and in the, um, especially in the Adirondacks where those lakes were really decimated a heck of a lot more by acid rain than we did to the, than we experienced with more fish kills and things like that. I mean, Gene Likens and, you know, tons of people have done a lot of work on, on those, but as far as kind of local. I mean, Kristen Strzok's paper, I think, was the first to start to track, um, who was also a, a Climate Change Institute alum um, back in, what was it, 96, was that? The work, the data was from 96. Yeah, yeah she was in um, 2010 era. And that was starting to um, document some of the changes in, in DOC that we think are related from those so I think that was the first, I'm sure there were a few that she based her work on as well, too. Because that, those were the first to start using our data. It just seems to me that that's a really valuable story to to tell more, like for a few reasons. Like one, one like to kind of, maybe we have an opportunity to kind of bring together that story kind of at a larger scale to rather than kind of just little piecemeal story, but to say like how the, how, Acadia National Parks ecosystems broadly are recovering after the after the Clean Air Act, and that that you know a lot of times as managers we were like all these problems are coming from outside the park, and can we do anything? And here we have this story, and and also does environmental policy actually accomplish anything? Um, and here we have this example of a of a policy that was trying to capture something that's you know at least on the order of in the neighborhood of climate change -ish problems. Um, and 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 we pass the legislation, and the legislation, like thirty or whatever years later, is like we can act, we can totally see the recovery, like like it's it's totally happening, and and I think that that's an important story to tell, um, and uh, and it makes me think like how do we how do we how do we tell that story? Because just last week, you know, Kate was Kate Miller was telling showing the same. Kind of recovery in our soils, mm -hmm. and so um, and so you know I think we have elements of that. Um, that's that's one of my favorite stories because years ago we had a visit from one of the congresswomen. Uh, I think it was Betty McCollum, who was who was you know on the on the uh, uh, Parks Appropriation Committee at the time, and and the, the Sheridan took her on a tour, and she was very interested in air quality and asked me to come and do a little dog and pony show for her. And we were on the summit Cadillac and, and it was a couple of days right after one of Sarah's papers, um, you know, that talked about the effects of the Clean Air Act and um, benefits of the Clear Act with public. And I mentioned that, and I men mentioned that, you know, some of the Acadia data were used in that for both the air and the water things. And she's like, and that actually shows that these that this really happens. And mm -hmm. and she got really excited and she had her little assistant that was there and said, make sure you write all this stuff down. This is the sort of thing that we should go back and be telling our colleagues. And it was like exactly what you said. I mean, it was and it was really refreshing to see somebody that, you know, that appreciated that. Yeah. And so that's been kind of my my battle cry ever since, you know, when I saw that is we have to tell that story. Sarah Sarah Nelson, do you wanna do you wanna unmute Sarah? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um 
I just put in the chat that um, just kind of to point out that there's some really related work going on in the Western Mountains um, in a subset of lakes that Julia Daly and Rachel Hovell have been working on. And they have long-term data like Acadia from the acidification work. And now they've instrumented them with temperature loggers and they're doing a lot of nutrient and food web work as well as collecting climate data for air temperatures and soils. So there's a lot of analogs there and those like similarly, you know, have the recovery from acidification piece as well as climate change influencing them and they're in a protected landscape. So it's kind of a nice, um, very related ongoing data set and study. That's great. Any last questions? We're just past the hour here. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys. Really thank appreciate you. it. And you're preparing this for publication, your your second century science that's coming out soon. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah.